trappers opposing as the gangsters while the government taking money as bonuses for bankers in life you learn to close your eyes and hold your tongue but together we will overcome there's never been a chosen one Okay, so day 12 just wrapped up. It was a really exciting day today. Stephen Matthews, they finished uh, cross-examining him. And there are some really interesting things that came out today from Stephen Matthews. Uh, they, they opened the day by accusing or asking him about uh, statements made by Calvin Air again, uh, emails uh, from Calvin Air. Um, they talked a lot about the trust that was set up and a lot about the, the, sign, the private signing sessions that happened. The, uh, the thing I mentioned yesterday I was unsure of where it seemed like there may be some inconsistency where Craig was saying that there was never a plan and Stephen Matthews was saying there was. I think that Stephen Matthews, it was just the time period that he was speaking from. It was after uh, McGregor had pressured them into agreeing to this. So um, that's what I was unsure of yesterday. But they spoke about that in a lot more detail today, asked uh, Cope asked a lot more questions about that and went into that in great detail. Um, Stephen Matthews insisted that a lot of his discussions with McGregor about these signing sessions were very heated and that he really didn't like how it was being pushed along by him, uh, but it doesn't come across in his communications that if you read his texts and emails, they don't convey emotion. And He had a very communicative very professional communication style, so you wouldn't read it in his communications how upset he was by the way the process was being pushed forward by McGregor. Um, Coppola was really trying to make the case that what McGregor was requesting and how he was requesting it was not unreasonable and was trying to get uh, Stephen Matthews to agree to that, but he wouldn't. Um, they talked a lot about what his role in particular was in like the big reveal and the blog post that was supposed to go out. And they wanted they they talked a lot about how Craig had sabotaged sabotaged that process by sending what he said was accidentally a non proof in place of the proof, like he was supposed to provide a proof for them to put up and post. And uh, he said that he sent the wrong one, but Stephen Matthews said that he'd come to believe that it was done on purpose because Craig didn't want to go forward with the signing. He felt like he was being pressured against his will. So he had intentionally sabotaged the process by providing a non-proof instead of the proof he was supposed to provide. And yeah, they, they talked about that in great detail. Um, the thing that they that I thought was most important from Stephen Matthews' testimony today in his cross-examination was that he backed up the idea that Gavin Andreessen was the one who installed the wallet uh, when they did the private, soft, uh, private signing. Uh, so Gavin Andreessen in the private signing insisted that they get a, uh, a brand new laptop and it seemed like in someone's statement, I think it was in Gavin's statement, um, he said something vague or may have implied that Craig had installed it and it may have been done when outside of his presence, but Craig had insisted that Gavin was there. And that he had full view of the, the computer the entire time throughout the entire process. And it was very important for Stephen Matthews to back that up, and he did. Because um, there is the claim that Craig could have uh, fooled him in that private signing session by modifying uh, a few lines of code so that he could fool him into thinking that he had access to uh, the Genesis blocks when he didn't or rather block, block one and block nine. Um, it really stands to reason that Gavin Andreessen would watch if he's insisting that they get a brand new laptop, that he would want to ensure that the process is legitimate in every other way as well. Um, he's not a foolish man, so I presume that if he insisted on getting a brand new laptop and installing it all on his own brand new computer, that he'd be wise enough to watch the process too. Uh, 
Um, so very, very good that he backed up Craig's side of the events there. Um, it got really interesting, though, at the end of his cross-examination when the judge had the opportunity, when uh, Judge Miller had the opportunity to ask him some questions. He wanted to know how he could be certain that he was presented the Bitcoin white paper prior to the issuance of the Bitcoin white paper. He wanted to know what sort of memory uh, anchor he was using to identify in his memory the time when he was presented the white paper. And... He sort of just said that he was certain it was before the issuance because he could just remember the issuance and that it must have been before then. Um, but it got really interesting when he wanted to know more about what was going on between N-Chain and Kristen Egger Hansen. Uh, so he wanted to know more about the comments that Chris Nager Hansen had made the threats that he had made against Stephen Matthews when he was threatening to destroy him, what he thought he meant by that. And Stephen Matthews said that he believed that he was threatening his reputation, that he was threatening to destroy his reputation, um, and that it would be sort of like an internet thing where he would be slandered online and try to destroy his reputation, destroy his credibility. He said that he was the one who personally fired uh, Chris Nager Hansen. And he said that they fired him with cause. The judge wanted to ask, the judge asked what, what cause they fired him for. And he said that he couldn't reveal all the details of it because there was an ongoing uh, investigation into that, essentially. But he said that it started when it was brought to his attention by uh, support staff that Chris Nager Hansen had requested access to eight staff emails and that Stephen Matthews email was one of those eight emails. So because that seemed highly unusual, the staff brought that to his attention. He obviously didn't approve that and said that he would never have approved that. And in his reply back to that staff member, CC Chris Neger Hansen, apparently he was uh, terminated very shortly after that. And When this all transpired, he said that uh, their security cameras at their office were covered up and then men showed up in vans and like raided their server rooms and stole some of their uh, security footage and some of their computers uh, and then drove off. Uh, so fairly serious allegations of criminal activity uh, happening at Enchain through Chris Nager Hansen. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there seems to have been a lot of fairly serious criminal allegations leveled at Chris Nager Hansen. Um, they said that he specifically fled to Norway uh, to escape uh, the legal consequences of what's happened. Um, So yeah, I mean, there's definitely, if you look at the things that Chris Nair Hansen's saying on Twitter, um, these guys are firing shots back and forth at each other all the time, it seems. Um, yeah, I mean, Calvin Air seems to be ignoring him, uh, but he's calling out Calvin Air quite a bit all the time on Twitter. Uh, it's, it's an, this is an interesting case. These are a lot of very wealthy people fighting each other in court, and it seems like whichever side loses, there should be people going to jail for this. Um, so, I mean, interesting things happen when you put very wealthy people in these circumstances. Especially these types of people who are very cutthroat business, cutthroat people. Uh, I'd be worried about people trying to harm one another throughout these legal proceedings. I hope uh, both sides have People protecting them, I would just say that. Um, especially given, yeah, that people might be going to jail and people with billions of dollars might be willing to do a lot of different things to avoid that. So you can read between the lines there. Um, but today was an interesting day because we actually saw uh, Craig's lawyers do something. They got to have, they got to cross-examine uh, one of three 
independent board members from COPA. Uh, they seem to put a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, they are talking about how uh, Mr. Lee is from Block. Um, so Block is Jack Dorsey's company. And he was saying that although he is from Block, he acts as a independent board member for COPA and he doesn't represent the interests of Block as a independent board member at COPA, but he acts in the broader interests of the crypto and blockchain space as a whole. And kind of, it's a little bit of nonsense. They obviously have a conflict of interest. What's good for BTC Core is good for them. And it would be bad for them if Craig were to win this case. So it's just an obvious conflict of interest that they are pointing out at the beginning there. Um, he, he was kind of made to look foolish because he was asked what his roles and responsibilities were. But, and he said that it was uh, his job to allocate where money goes. And he was asked who was financing uh, the legal proceedings. And he was asked about if the Bitcoin defense uh, website was funding the core developers' uh, cases as well as COPA's case. And it was really bad for him because he gave, I think, three answers. He was asked initially if they were funding it, and he said he didn't think so. And then he said maybe, and then he said that they were. Um, so it was just weak. He, he came across very weak on the stand. He came across as being very nervous. He didn't have a lot of confidence. You can see that right from the beginning. He seemed nervous. Um, there wasn't anything incredibly bad, I would say, that he did, but it, he just didn't look good on the stand. There were certain things that I believe he must have been lying about like he was asked right away about how meta had left copa right before the trial started and he was asked why copa left or why meta left copa and he stated that he wasn't sure that he wasn't involved in any of the conversations with them leaving and he pretty much just pled the fifth and acted like he had no idea but that isn't believable like they're the largest member they're by by market capitalization, by far the biggest, like providing the most amount of money to COPA. Uh, so for him to say as one of their three independent board members that he has no idea why their largest member left and confirming that they left early, that a typical membership has to be at least three years and they left within that three-year period instead of on the other side of that three-year period. It's just suspect that he's claiming that he doesn't know that. I don't believe that. I think what actually happened is that the answer there is harmful to their case and he doesn't want to say so in court. So he's just going to plead the fifth and act like he doesn't know. That's what, that's the impression I get. And I'm pretty sure the judge is going to feel that way too because it's not a believable answer. Um, he said that one of the other uh, independent board members is from Paradigm and they're uh, venture capitalist firm. The other one was from Coin Center. I think he meant to say Coinbase. Maybe it was Coin Center. I'll have to verify that. My my stream was kind of uh, pausing. It was freezing in and out. Mr. Lee did a weak job for Copa. I feel like what Craig's team, what Craig's lawyers were tr was trying to do in their cross examination of him, was paint the case that they're not really this independent organization acting on behalf of the greater crypto community, but there are these group of independent businesses that are acting on their own best interests. And really that's, that's what Copa is. So he's just kind of, I thought he did a good job of pointing that out uh, in the way that he was questioning Mr. Lee. And all in all, I think it was a good day for Craig. I think that they did a great job of, um, Building up the story to add the credibility to the documentation that they're going to need. This story isn't going to convince the judge on its own. They're going to need that documentation. They're going to need those list of suspected forgeries. Craig's team is going to have to prove throughout the rest of the trial that those forgeries are not forgeries. 
in order for the story to carry weight applied to those documents for Craig to win. Um, or something sneaky like the watermark thing that people keep speculating about. I think there is um, Xiaowei Lu saying that it, it could be something that is contained within the latex file itself uh, and not within uh, the PDF version of the white paper, that it could be something that you can only identify through the uh, latex file. So perhaps the latex document that Craig provided uh, contains a watermark that could be used to identify him as Satoshi. Um, wild speculation at this point. It, it could be exactly what wins in the case, but it could just be uh, wishful thinking and hopium. So we'll have to wait and see. I'm excited for tomorrow. <laughs>